Well, we're talking about uh, People's Be Weird is a series, and the first week we talked about God made you different, and that's a good thing. We talked about how the distinctiveness and differences of us, although they sometimes frustrate us, we learn to love each other by working through those kind of complications. The second week we said, manage your money, your money will manage you, and we talked about that last week. And we were talking about that, that ruthlessness you need in dealing with your money and to not allow money to become the biggest thing in your life. Put it in its place. It has a place. It can be used for good things and, and all those kind of things. We talked about mastering debt a little bit and those kind of things. This is the third week of that series. Next week is the more my friend loves Jesus, the better they'll love me. This week we're talking about intimacy, and intimacy is about more than marriage. And you'll see kind of where I'm going with this. Just a couple of things which form the basis of my talk today that I'll just walk you through and I'll give you a little bit of an idea where I'm coming from. The first one is this, is that God made sex. God invented it. It's his invention, okay? And the idea is that sex kind of belongs to the devil and it's bad and it's nasty and all those kind of things is false. God created sex. He thought it was a good idea. He ingrained it into the human beings and we are all sexual people, okay? And that's a good thing all right someone uh, you know once said to me he said pastor you know when you're talking about sex with married people you know it does, don't don't you find sex kind of animalistic and dirty and kind of wild and stuff i said only if it's done right <laughs> <laughs> so today we're talking about intimacy it's god's idea the second is god has set up a framework in order for our sexual appetite to be to work like all appetites it has a framework there are many good things in life that you can kill yourself exceeding in. okay? One of them, uh, you know, might be food. You know, I love food. I love good, f really good food. But I find when I'm, like the spring, when I'm really into ice cream, I find I can see myself. <laughs> you know, if you can't see your toes, that's a big deal, okay? Something's going on there. So you can, people actually in our society are eating themselves to death. They really are. A lot of uh, major heart problems and all those things come from actually how we eat and what we eat and all that kind of, that's the holistic people take over. All right? And, uh, and so a good thing taken to an extreme can actually be detrimental. Sleep is good for you. To sleep 20 hours a day is very bad for you. Okay? So good things have an application or a framework in which they work best. Okay? And the third part of this is this framework is applied properly, sex is an amazing gift, okay? There's a way God set up the idea or the, the act of sex that it lends itself to the best application to that, okay? It is, is a well-known statistic, well, maybe not well-known as much as we like to say, but uh, studies found that women who are um, committed to religion, and it doesn't matter what religion, but they're very religious, but particularly Christian women who are in a marriage, um, often indicate they are the ones who have the most fulfilling sex. They are right at the top. So, you know, the idea that the bad girls out there that are going from partner to partner are having great sex is actually a bit of a myth. The people having the most meaningful sex are people in committed relationship with one person over long term. Okay? And that's a well-known statistic. There's actually interesting, there's articles right now talking about millennials and Generation Z and how their approach to sex is different. There are actually the number of people who would call themselves or be a virgin what, lasting well into their 20s has gone up. And there's a lot of millennials and, and Gen Z that are putting off sex until later and are putting off marriage. We call this extended adolescence. We talked a little bit about this as a congregation, but people are taking a different approach to sexuality than previous generations. And so there's always kind of a mix up. I realize also this is a topic that in our society is often confusing. Um, a lot of unrealistic expectations are placed on people. I want to just say this from the out outset. Um, <clears throat> there's kind of a negative vibe that people get um, in both being single and being married. Okay? So we talk about the guys getting married, and you know, it's just a message, oh, your life's going to end, and you know, you're going to put the ball and chain on, and you're, you're basically going to enjoy your last few days of freedom, and all that kind of stuff. And we make people feel really crappy for getting married. And then there's the other side, people who are single. And actually, studies show that 50% of adults in Canada are actually single right now. They've been divorced, or they're single, or they've had a spouse pass away, or those kind of things. So this is a meaningful, large group. And sometimes married people make them feel like they're incomplete, and that is just wrong. Sing being single does not mean you're incomplete. 
And anybody that makes you feel guilty by putting pressure on you or, you know, and sometimes the snide little jokes or somebody, in, you know, invites you to meet their cousins, 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 you know, who, who <clears throat> you know, has one leg um, or something like that. And they're trying to match you up, okay, kind of thing. That, that can be very degrading for a person. You can be complete in yourself as a single person, okay? In fact, it's interesting. The scripture I'm walking through today, the author of this um, passage is actually more for single people than married people. And that's kind of an interesting, uh, different take on it because the assumption is, particularly in the church, is that, that everybody needs to be married. You know, and that's not always the case. And there are times in life where you're not going to be married or you're going to be lonely whether you're married or not. And so the message of today, if I can get it through, is God has you where you are for a reason. And he has uh, an incredible life of uh, fulfillment for you, even as a sexual being right now, okay? And so if, you know, you're, you're one of those people that, you know, either feels that, you know, because you're married, you're missing out on all the fun, or because you're single, you're missing out on all the fun. Uh, it's, it's, that's not the message you want to get forward to you today, and it's certainly not the message of Scripture, Okay. And so I just want to say that from the outset. So, so if you're in one of those camps and you, you, know, you're, you feel that kind of tension around you and stuff, I just want to let you know that God loves you completely as you are, as an individual. Okay? Marriage is great. Sex is great. But being single can be pretty great too. Okay? And there's pluses and minuses to it. So let's just walk through. First of all, I want to avoid two extremes that are kind of the framework that a lot of churches work in. And, and actually, this is derived from an old New Testament heresy called Gnosticism. In the Greek world, Gnostics were people that separated the physical from the spiritual. And so in their mind, everything spiritual was good, or anything good was spiritual. Anything physical was bad. And so the Gnostics, the Greek people, they used to go in two radical directions. The first one was uh, what we call hedonism or Epicureanism. Epicureans basically go, well, you know, the life's here. It's, you know, there's no, the body's evil. You know, if it's going to be evil, may as well have at it. You know, uh, eat, drink, and be merry. And so they'll go sexually from partner to partner. They'll do whatever feels good. They basically follow their impulses around with them. Um, I think of a... Uh, Ernest Hemingway, he was a great writer, but I remember his, how he died. He died, he committed suicide with a shotgun, and the reason he committed suicide is he said that his body would no longer keep up with his desires. He felt his body breaking down, and he had lived for the passions of life so extremely that when those passions went, that Epicureanism went, he felt life wasn't worth living. And so he shot himself with a shotgun. That's an Epicurean lifestyle. The second is what I call the Stoic lifestyle. The Stoic lifestyle is basically the lifestyle where you deny everything. Because the body's evil, you need to starve it out. You need to punish it. You need to be hard on yourself. And in the early church, there were some extreme examples. We had people living up on top of a, a pole, you know, for 30 years, you know, t chained to it so they wouldn't fall over when they go to sleep. We had people doing horrible things to their bodies. We had people running away from society, all those kind of things, because they felt like they should be Stoics. And so I call this the angel and the animals extreme, okay? Treating people as if they're angels or treating people as if they're animals. You're neither, okay? You're not an animal and you're not an angel. You're a human being. And the fact that you have sexuality is actually a good thing. God made you like this. And you may say, it doesn't feel like a good thing. It's so complicated. I have all these passions. You know, it kind of pours over, all those kind of things. I was a young adults pastor for many years. And pastoring young adults, this is a really big theme. I always said, if you want to be a young adults pastor, you had to talk on three things. Sex, the end times, and will there be sex during the end times? Those were the three topics you had to cover if you're doing young adults. And that was kind of a big deal for those kind of things. But anyways... So let's look at a couple of scriptures. The first one, if you're approaching things, is animals. Paul says, do not offer parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. I put this in human terms, because you are weak in your mature natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body as slavery and impurity to an ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. Paul was writing to the church in Corinth. The ancient Greek uh, church of Corinth had the temple of Aphrodite in it. It was a temple that employed a thousand prostitutes at a time. 
And Corinth, Corinth was kind of the Las Vegas of its day. So basically, you know, there, there used to be a saying in Corinth, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth, right? You know, it's, it's that, kind of, that kind of place. In fact, people looked at it that when they saw a, de- a degraded sexual approach to life, they used to call it to Corinthize. And that's quite literally what it meant. It was a city where it wasn't uncommon for your everyday farmer on his way to work to sleep with a prostitute in order to gain the God's favors so that, you know, his crops would grow and those kind of things. It was very common and it was taken for granted. It was a very immoral city. It had a lot of people traveling through. It had a lot of things to offer and a a lot of things that a hedonist would really enjoy. And Paul was saying, you're called by Christ to have a different master. You're you're not under that, that old law. God went by his grace has made you a new person. And so you don't have to do that. You don't have to be an animal. You know, many people will say, sex drives are strong and there's no way to resist them. Actually, you know, there are ways to deal in healthy ways with sexuality that are, you know, readily available to everybody. It's just a lot of times we treat ourselves or we treat others like they're animals, like they just can't, you know, help themselves. And the truth of the matter is, under God's grace, you do have the ability to make decisions, good decisions. And the second one is the angels when we treat ourselves like angels. The Spirit clearly says, in the latter days, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been sealed with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and those who know the truth. For everything God created is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Read this verse with it where it says everything. Everything God created is good. Everything God created is good. Who created sex? God. Okay. Sex is a good thing. Okay. And, uh, and you are not an angel. Okay. You're not. You weren't designed to be sexless. Okay. You were designed with these passions and these drives and these desires and all those kind of things. It was part of the mix of what makes you, you. And although the world would kind of teach you that the application of those things always needs to happen in an evil context, I differ. I think the best expression of those needs happens within God's framework because that's where it's meant to go. All right, so three quick points, and then I, I'm, I know you're all dying to ask questions, seeing as I'm a sexpert. Um, so we're going to go through those three things in this passage, 1 Corinthians 7. First of all, this is written to the church in Corinth. Paul just finishes in chapter 6, a long passage, imploring the, the Corinthian people not to sleep with prostitutes and to honor their body. Your, God, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to talk to people who are in different states of marriage or not marriage or single or all those kind of things and give some really good advice, okay? Now, I want to qualify this a little bit. Paul in passages, parts of this passage says, this is a command from the Lord. And then he has another places where he says, this is what I recommend, okay? It tends to be in scripture when Paul says, I recommend things that a number of times, what he's saying is not everybody's going to agree with this and that's okay. Uh, this is kind of how I see the world, and so, you know, that's, that's an okay thing. But when Paul says, this is from the Lord, that's chapter and verse. That's the stuff that God says, you got to do this. This is, this is a violation of God's law and of God's love. And so he uh, talks about those in grace and for those things. Okay, the first one is this. Um, up, a, up a one, please, thanks, Elaine. Look to your present situation as a gift. Paul talks about your present situation as a gift. Let's read the scripture. Now, for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have a sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to the husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to the wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, and the other has that. If you're single, it's a gift. If you're married, it's a gift. Okay? 
And, and really, when you think logically about this, outside of your passions, you can look at that and you can go, you know what, there are advantages. Paul talks about the advantages of a singleness. Now, I think Paul probably was married when he was a young Jewish boy. It would have been very odd if he wasn't. He was probably married as a teenager. We don't know where his wife is, whether she left him or died or whatever. But when Paul comes onto the scene, there is no wife in the picture. And this happens, you know, from a time he is young. And so it's quite possible he had a wife, she passed away, or something else happened. Probably she passed away because Paul was still very much of the religious order in the Hebrew um, culture and probably wouldn't have been able to continue that if he had been a divorcee. So here's Paul, and he's going through this and, and things, and he's identifying, uh, it really, if he leans any way, he leans on the single side. He says, you know, as a single, I can serve the Lord wholeheartedly. I can do what I want. I have a certain amount of freedom. I have the ability to do this. Nothing kind of constrains me. But he also says, hey, being married is a gift too. Being married is wonderful. You have a partner, a soulmate. You know, um, you have all the things, the benefits that go with a marriage. You have someone there to support you, someone to grow old with, all those kind of things. Both of them are a gift. And what he's trying to say here is we will it down. We'll get a little more to this, but learn to be content where you are before you move on to something else. Learn to be content in who you are before you move on to something else. Sometimes people come to me and they say, you know, we're deciding to get married. I say, well, how long have you known each other? Well, two months. And, and I, I sit down with them and I say, okay, let's have a little talk, you know, about how well you know this person. Okay, first of all, take the thing about them that you find most annoying and ask this question. If I marry this person, am I going to be able to live with this fault with it out changing for the rest of my life. If you can't, don't marry this person. Or, what do you know about this person? Do you realize that someday he's going to have hair growing out of the oddest places in his body? And that's going to be really gross? Do, do you realize that someday she will lift up her arms and she'll have arm fat that hangs down like the wings of succubus? Do you know that? You know, notes people don't know that going into a marriage, right? They don't know those kind of things, or they never think about them. And part of that's the way God designed us. We have that romantic, you know, oh, I'm in goo, and, you know, I love them, and they're perfect for me. i got to be honest with you. Going back to the first week, God made you different, and that's a good thing. It's actually healthy to marry somebody, because a good marriage is built on encountering differences, working through them, and finding what us looks like. Okay, that's, that's a good marriage. Marriage sometimes is grating on each other because i got to be honest with you, it's really easy to love somebody who's loving me. But man, you want to teach me love, bring a jerk into my life. They're the hardest people to love, right? And if you learn to love difficult people, including your spouse, you learn to love properly. Because here's the thing, someday someone's going to be looking you in the eye and you're going to be the jerk. Do you want that person to say, I'm done with you and walk away? Or do you want that person to say, you know what, I know you're not perfect, I know you have your faults, but I still choose you, right? And that's a healthy marriage, okay? So where are you? It's a gift. It's a gift where you are now, and use that time. Sometimes people come to me and get married, and they're very young. The actual divorce rate declines, the older people are when they get married. So a lot of people, when they're you know, in their early 20s, that are concerned to get married, that's a good thing. I was 22, my wife was 19 when we got married, and that could be a very healthy thing. And you know, a lot of people recognize that you know, with us, that was the right thing to do. But a lot of people in their early 20s don't really know themselves yet, and they don't really have an idea who they are. And so a lot of times while they're married and they're going through those formative years, they're trying to find out who they are as well as what does us look like. And some people can do that, some people can't. And so it's another thing, just to be aware of. Okay, second point. If you're going to change your station, do it for the right reasons. Paul goes on to write. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried, as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To be married, married I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she mustn't remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not, must not divorce his wife. 
To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who's not a believer and she's willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and she's, he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if an unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you'll save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you'll save your wife? Now, there's a lot of complicated things in here about divorce, remarriage, all those kind of things. But the message here really is, for Paul, say, you know, ask this question. If I'm so discontent in my present state, what do I think is going to change if I go through a divorce or if I get married or if I separate from my spouse? That's a good question, right? What do I think is going to happen that will improve my life? Some people say, well, I, I just want peace. You know, we're fighting all the time and I just want peace. And hey, I come from a single parent household. I know how it is. And I have to say to this day, I think my mother and my father coming apart was one of the best things that ever happened to my life. My father was a very violent, very destructive individual. He was starting to throw us around with an abandon and he was not above hitting his wife and doing those things. And, and them coming apart created in our household the stability that I needed as a child to grow up in, okay? So there are situations where I think, you know, the best thing that can happen is to dissolve the marriage. But a lot of times I talk to people and they'll come to me and they'll say, I'm so miserable in my marriage, okay? You know, and I'll say, okay, what, what's leading? Well, we're fighting all the time and we're doing this and all those kind of things, okay. And then they say, I, I just want it to stop. I just want to leave. And I say, okay, let's say you do. Um, you know, let's say you have a couple of kids. Do you really think getting divorced is going to mean this individual is not going to be in your life? What do you mean? Well, you have kids. You share kids. You're going to be dealing with this individual the rest of your life. And so if you get divorced, do you think you're going to have a workable relationship with that individual where you get along well enough that you're not influencing your kids in a negative way? I talk about the cost. Okay. Let's say you get divorced. How are you going to eat? What are you going to do? It's not, that I'm, it's not that I'm trying to be mean to people. I'm trying to bring them to a framework. So you want to be married. Okay, what are you going to do about this? What does this look like? All those kind of things. Ask honest questions. If you're going to change, change for the right reasons. Paul said, if I'm burning with passion, probably a good idea to get married because that's God's expression of how I express those things. But if you're in a situation, you're always thinking, I've got to change, you've got to ask yourself some hard questions. And one of the questions that Paul was addressing in this passage were people that became followers of Christ and their spouse wasn't. And they were thinking, well, you know, that's not good. They're not a believer. I need to leave them. I need to go. You know, all those kind of things. And Paul said, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Think, think about the consequences of doing that and think of the benefits. Maybe you're the only person your spouse is going to see that represents Jesus in their life. And, and when I'm dealing with people that are going through a divorce or getting married or anything like that, I always, always ask them this. I say, just count the cost. Count the cost of what this change in your station will be. Look the hard questions in the eye. And you know what? I've been amazed. And I, I didn't used to do this, but I've been amazed that when I ask some good questions with people who are going through a tough time in their marriage, sometimes it inspires them to work harder at their marriage, and there's some great results. I've seen this happen time and time again. Sometimes I'm advising someone they're in a destructive situation when the individual will not change, and, and they'll say, you know, what do I do at this point? And, you know, while you preserve the marriage, I don't blame them sometimes when they move on. I remember there was uh, one young lady I knew, and she, she was uh, married to this guy who would not work. And he stayed at home. And he played on the computer, and she worked three jobs to keep their heads above water. And she went on and on and on and on doing this. Until one day, she had an affair and left him. And I remember I was thinking, she made some bad choices there, you know, to, to cheat on her husband and do all that. But there was a piece of me that said, you know what, there's two sides to every story. 
And, and, and maybe this was her cry for help, her escape from a situation she didn't know what to do with. I'm not condoning sin, folks. I, I just, I was kind of looking at that situation and going, what would I have done? You know, what, what do you advise somebody in that situation? She had a husband who was going to leech off her and, you know, depend on her to take care of him while he went from thing to thing to thing. And that wasn't a healthy situation. And Paul talks about some of those situations where there's an unhealthy marriage. And he said those who dissolve those or they're abandoned by their couple of things are not bound in such things. And like I said, I could do a whole series on this. Third point is this. <clears throat> Live as a believer first and trust God with, the, with what you cannot control or change. This is, uh, again, getting back to the core message, the idea of contentment. Paul says... Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is a rule I laid down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he's called? He should be, not become uncircumcised. Was a man circum, uncircumcised when he's called? He should be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's command is what counts. Each person should remain in the situation they were when God called them. Uh, circumcision, that's kind of a interesting topic on a week like this. I, I, I can only imagine, you know, Abraham, when God revealed to him that this was going to be the calling card of the new race. You know, what he must have felt. Noah got a rainbow. <laughs> Maybe we could have like a secret handshake or something, you know, like, you want me to do what with what, you know? But there was actually people going around the early church trying to teach this and get people to do it. And, you know, you have 50-year-olds sitting down and going, okay, i got to do this. How do I do this? You know, and it's just awful situations. And Paul says, look, they're nothing. What counts is that God has called you. And where you are, whether you're married or single or whatever, live as a believer in that situation. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although you can gain your freedom, do so. The one who is a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's free person. Similarly, the one who is free when Christ called is Christ's slave. Or when God called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. Brothers and sisters, each person is responsible to God to remain in the situation they were in when God called them. So, the question is, are you married or are you single? Are you looking to life and going, if just this one thing happened, I would be fulfilled? I would challenge you in that. It's not that it's wrong to change your station. Just do it for the right reasons. Here was Paul, a single man, writing to a church in Corinth where sex was just this common thing that was thrown around and, and people acted like animals. And he was saying, hey, this is sacred. This is a good thing. Just do it in the proper context. And then ask yourself this question. Where are you right now? Changing your station is it going to make you more of a believer than you are now. It's not going to make you more of an unbeliever than you are now. Learn to be content the way God has you and trust Him with how things change. Now, he talks about slavery. He said, if you can be free, go, go be free. That's a wonderful thing. If you can be married, he says earlier in the passage, be married. It's better to marry than to burn with passion. If you can stay single, and that's a gift, look at it as a gift. You're not less of a person because you're not married. Either way, the most important thing is your relationship with Christ. And I have people come, and they, they throw all kinds of scenarios out. What if I want to do this or want to do that? And I said, look, this is the life of a believer. It is laying myself at Christ's feet and going, you're the Lord of my life. I surrender everything of myself to you. My passions, my wants, my materials, all, all these kind of things. Everything I am is now yours. You are the Lord of my life. And I have to love him enough that if he says, look, here's an area of your life that isn't consistent with my love and my grace and my commands, I have to ask the question, would I give that up because I love him enough? And if you don't, just be honest about it. Being a follower of Christ is putting my priorities in that line and then going, okay, if Christ is my Lord, what has he created me to do? Where does he have me? And then live as a believer. Read your scriptures. Pray. Come to church. Learn to, to live and all those kind of things. Like, it's, it's incredible. And many people will tell you this. You know, if you've got time, use it. What station are you in? Work hard in that time. And that 
is all I got to say about that. So um, we've got a mic going to go around. I can take some questions. I actually have enough time. Now, I got the coffee card to draw with for um, if you brought your mug. And there's all these little pieces uh, there, but there's one big piece of cardboard that says Trish Clarkson. So, I, you know, just for creativity, for being different, I got to give this coffee card to her. Trish, where are you? <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> Uh, okay, now this is my uh, cell number. If you're embarrassed to ask a question out loud, then you can text me. I won't read your name out, at least I'll try not to. And uh, if, so if you want to text me a question, I got my phone on me. If you want to ask a question for every question about today's topic, you get a free chocolate bar. It's a pretty good deal. I got some caramels and, pardon me? You can have two. It's very hedonistic, but in this case it applies, right? Otherwise, I got to take these all home and eat myself. So don't ask any questions. All right, questions or comments? Someone have a question or comment? Yeah. Does it have to do with today's topic? It does, yeah. Okay, exactly. you go for it. All right. There is a, well, it's kind of in that scenario because I saw this video a long time ago that where there's um, a guy walking with his girlfriend down a pot, like a, in, at a beach somewhere. Yeah. This other guy pulls up in his sports car and starts... Um, hollering to his girlfriend hey where do you guys want to you guys guys want to go out for dinner or something yeah and the whole situation to me just kind of made me think there's a guy that he just doesn't know this guy other guy's girlfriend yeah and he's asking her out for a date yeah well the other guy is kind of getting jealous and saying why are you doing this to my girlfriend man just yeah. leave her alone you know it's like you know he doesn't realize <laughs> all is fair in love and war <laughs> right if he wants it put a ring on it <laughs> right <laughs> There you go. There you go. Okay. I, it was lame, but I'll give you a chalk. There you go, buddy. Thanks. <laughs> no, that's good. All right. Somebody else? Question? Comment today about today's topic? Questions or comments? I know there's people that have questions. They might be a little shy about it. So you can text me. I got nothing. Nothing coming in. Okay. <laughs> Two topics that people often ask in confidence or mention afterwards in this, this kind of uh, thing uh, that I'll just bring up briefly. First of all is the pornographication of our society. Pornography is now inundated um, all over college campus, university campuses. They've done studies and they've had a harder time finding young men who are not using pornography than are. There's actually a growing field with many women who are engaging in pornography and all those kind of things. I want to say this. And I believe this is from the Lord. God is generally not for that, okay? For a whole plethora of reasons, okay? Uh, God has designed us to honor the body of our spouse and to honor women and respect them and as well as men, okay? And, and the creation of all those kind of things, there's many people that are in kind of a bondage of this and it's something that they're addicted to. There's a little... Uh, 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 kind of adrenaline that goes off when you engage in those kind of things. And I want to say, first of all, you're not alone. Okay? E even in this room, there's probably all kinds of people that struggle with this topic. Uh, but there is freedom. There are all kinds of groups now forming people, and, and sometimes to find a good godly mentor and just talk about some of those things and, and to come uh, clean on that and, uh, and to head towards the right direction is a good thing. It's, it's something the church doesn't talk about enough. Uh, we talk about it here pretty often, but uh, it's something a lot of people struggle with, and I think it's a form of bondage in our society. Kate. Um, I'm not sure the actual, like, where you found it in the, the like, Bible up there, uh, but I really the scripture up that says, like, women, your body is not yours, and men, your body is not yours. That's one of my favorite verses, um, yeah. Because so much in our society, um, in Christian society, yes. um, it's women... Your bodies are not yours. Yes. But um, Scott and I, we actually went to a marriage conference mm -hmm. uh, weekend. Yes. And um, it was it was really good until the very last day, and the women and men were separated. Yes. And the women were being taught that yes. it is a sin. Yes. To not give sex to your husband. Really. If. Yeah. they ask for it yeah and i stood right up and i said show me in the bible where it says that yeah and i was very respectful but very adamant that that is wrong yes and it's just it's really good to see that uh, you are saying that you know women your bodies 
or your husbands, husbands, your bodies are your wives. Like, yes, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's not just, point. hey, women, yeah. your husband owns you. Yeah. And when yeah. he wants to have a relationship or yeah. relations, then. Do you know the last 50 or 60 years, we've made some real changes in society. Part of it has been technological advances and things like that has made uh, things, but a lot of it's sociological, which is really healthy where we are respecting men and women as equals. This actually is not a revolutionary concept. Way back in the New Testament, Paul, of all people, said there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, everybody is one in Christ Jesus. And the church was probably one of the first organizations that ever, ever recognized equality between men and women. And that's a healthy, healthy thing. And that is a good passage. It really is. It's a good passage for a couple of reasons. One is, it says, if you're married, you should be having sex. You know, I, I occasionally get someone roar up to me afterwards and say, what, you mean I got to have sex with my wife or my husband? And I'm thinking, first of all, why did you get married then? Like if you wanted a pen pal or, you know, a Facebook friend or whatever, you can do that. I mean, why are you married? Okay, this is a good thing. It's a holy thing. And if you've got issues with it, work through them. Talk to your doctor. Do whatever you need to do, okay? And, and this is a good thing, okay? But at the same time, it's re recognizing God's holy way of doing things. And so there's a respect that goes with it, a mutual respect, where your partner is comfortable, where you are enjoying each other, where you are not slipping into some sort of degrading kind of activities that, uh, that make a person feel ugly and shameful and those kind of things. And, and that's, those are those areas we need to respect each other in that. Anybody else? Question? Hey, Grace. It is not really a question, but I was just thinking about um, Paul there who said that he was single and that was what the Lord had called him to. Yeah. And um, the bottom line is that a little while ago I read about this person, and I'm sorry I can't remember his name, but I think there are some really um, people who dedicated their lives to God and achieved yeah. great, great things yes. that otherwise, uh, like things that have really blessed the world and remain yes. potently helpful. Yes. But they had to or decided to that that was their calling. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can achieve a great deal if God calls you to something that yeah. otherwise would have been normal. Activity. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, the message there is don't hold it back, right? Like Mother Teresa, who was single, accomplished great things for God. She really did. Billy Graham, who was married, accomplished great things for God in a marriage relationship. Once I interviewed Ruth Graham and they said, do you ever think about divorce? She says, no, but I occasionally do think of murder. Okay? <laughs> That's what defines a lot of marriages. But anyways... Yeah, it's, it's a, that's a good thing. Both of them thrived in whatever office God had given them. Anybody else? Question? Okay, the second topic, which people often email me in and ask about and all those kind of things, is masturbation. All right? And they go, you know, is this ungodly? Is this this? Is it that kind of thing? I want to say this, quite honestly. There is nowhere in the Bible that I know that mentions masturbation. And if it was as big a deal as sometimes we feel it is, you think God would have found times to mention it. Now, there's a passage that God, Christ talks about lusting after a woman and all those kind of things, um, which, which, you know, you can kind of interpret that way, but I don't think that's what he meant, okay? And so if that's something you're struggling with and, uh, and something that you're racked with guilt with and all those kind of things, I, I want to just say God loves you. I occasionally will get someone come up and say, you know what, I'm a Christian, I haven't masturbated in 25 years. And they kind of look like they haven't. <laughs> a little stiff. <laughs> okay, I want to say something just about that. I'm really going out in left field here, but this is, this is true. Okay? About 25% of men, and, and probably a little higher of women, um, sex isn't their big issue. It might be money, it might be you know, pride, it might be that kind of thing. It's not sex. And so those individuals who I meet, kind of the idea of not engaging in sex is not a big deal for them, and they can kind of go on. It's not that you're more disciplined, it's, and I appreciate your discipline in doing this, but it's just that that's not your big issue, okay? And, and, and to stand up in a room full of guys and, and say the rest of you are scum because you do this, or are women, or whatever kind of thing. I want to say, this work towards Christ but this area of life, if it's holding you back from volunteering in your church or reading your Bible or all those kind of things, the enemy is the author of guilt. Christ is the author of conviction. Conviction is different than guilt. Conviction says there's a better way. 
I'm going to praise God, I'm going to do that, I'm going to live that way, and that might, might, might mean that you don't masturbate as much or you don't masturbate at all. That's good. That's a good thing. Move in that direction. Or if you struggle with that a lot, you're probably somebody who needs to get married. And so probably pray to God and say, God, I need somebody to marry. And prayerfully wait until he brings you in that situation where you can do that. Okay? You know, there's all kinds of complications mixed up in that. You know, if you're someone who has, you know, dated six girls and they've all run away absolutely repulsed, they're not the problem. Okay? <laughs> and vice versa. You know, it's good, it's good to, you know, do a self-evaluation in that, but live in Christ in there. And I probably said more than I need to there, but anybody else? All right, Scott's done the sex talk. <laughs> you can, yeah, <laughs> thanks. If anybody else has any questions or whatever and you want to email me, forget it. I've already done my research, and uh, from now on I'm going to forget most of this. And uh, not, I'm just kidding. But if you want to email or anything that. We're going to bring the baskets forward. In the baskets we have outies and innies. The outies are the ones you take stuff out of. The innies are the ones you put stuff in. The outies have in it offering envelopes, response cards. If you want to be on our mail list, if you want to receive the emails every week, if you want me to text you regularly, probably more than you'd ever want, put your cell number on there and those kind of things, and we'll make sure you're on the appropriate list. There's also offering envelopes. God bless you as you give. Thank you. And, uh, and when we're doing that, I just have a quick quote show to go up. Oh, and, uh, and Selena has an announcement, so afterwards the quote show will go up. Thank you. All right, so I get to follow that lovely sermon. <laughs> <laughs> I ha feel like a little bit of what you guys have to follow normally.